Welcome, everyone. I'd like to thank you for coming out today. And if they're here, I'd especially like to thank the person that has the room next to mine for enduring with me and coming out after already hearing the presentation 30 times. This is the presentation, performance testing with AWS. If you're hoping for a different one, you're in the wrong room or I'm in the wrong room, stick around anyways. Have some good content coming up. My name is Justin, and I'm a FileMaker application developer with Codents. I'm also a first-time FileMaker DevCon attendee. And that's not necessarily by choice. It just happens that I'm fairly new to the FileMaker scene. I've been doing this for about a year. And one of the reasons for that is I am one of the alumnus from 42. It's something I'm excited to talk about, but I don't want to take away from the presentation. So feel free to ask me about it afterwards or if you see me around the conference. Also, I'd like to share a personal detail about myself. I pay my taxes. I know what you're thinking. That's a weird personal detail to share at DevCon. What did he do to tick off the IRS? I'm talking about my internet taxes. However, I'm not a cat person. So I have ferrets. And Rosemary told me I was lucky. I had a baby two months ago, and you can never go wrong with a baby. So that's my family. Thank you. At the beginning, it said I was a FileMaker application developer, not a PowerPoint presentation designer. So when it came to creating this, I looked at a lot of templates, and most of them start off with a quote. So I decided to go ahead and include my favorite quote, which is, two things are infinite, the universe and human stupidity. And I'm not sure about the universe. It was Einstein that said that. I think it's perfect for this presentation because none of us are infallible. It doesn't matter how long you've been a developer, if you consider yourself an expert in the field, we all still make mistakes. And this presentation will help you with catching those mistakes before they become real world problems for you or your clients. I also want to kick off with something a little unusual. I want to sell you FileMaker, just like you came to me and said, hey, Justin, I want to take my business off of Excel. I'm going to tell you, well, FileMaker's great. You can have the application on mobile devices. You can have it on the web. You can integrate with other services and databases. You can upload photos, videos, PDFs, and there's great reporting tools built in. It's going to be faster for you. You're not going to be switching between Excel documents and sheets, trying to remember what page you put it on. And it'll be a better user experience for your employees. I remember working for a company where we did everything in Excel. And we tried our best to make it look like FileMaker. We had scripted buttons, conditional formatting. Somebody would come to me and they'd say, Justin, why is there not a total on this page anymore? And I would have to go in and look at it. And I knew exactly what it was. Steve, come on, how many times do I tell you? Paste values only. Or somebody would come up and they'd say, you know, Justin, I get this column. Green numbers are good, red numbers are bad. What's a purple number? You dig in, you look at it, and cell should be purple if it doesn't contain absent. Come on, Steve. Also, you can control who has access to information and who can change it. And let's admit it, you have your own application for your business, that's just cooler. So you may wonder, why did I just sell FileMaker to a room of FileMaker developers? Well, the reason is, if something comes up and we make a mistake, and our solution is no longer faster than Excel, well, I can tell you one thing. It's definitely not cooler. So what have we been testing? We're doing load testing and data volume testing. And load testing is looking at how our FileMaker solutions are going to perform when we have multiple clients connecting and users are performing their daily tasks. But some solutions are bigger than others. And sometimes the solution that we build may not work as well in the future because some businesses grow. So where we had five clients connecting, we now have 25. We're also looking at data volume testing. And that's understanding how the FileMaker application is going to perform after accumulating months or even years of data. And we need the application to perform the same whether it has one, 10,000, or one million records in a table. And just like I mentioned in the previous slide, businesses grow, well, so do the business needs. They may add new functions to their database, 
and now you have more tables and even more records. I also want to pose a bit of a trivia question. What's wrong with this? As a quick overview, it's a basic layout. It has a merge variable on it. We're setting its static text, showing the window for a certain duration, and we're closing the window. Just keep it in the back of your mind. I'm going to go over it towards the end of the presentation, but I will give you a couple hints. It is not step two. It's not something like it's going to be too large for the window or it's going to display off screen. And it's also not my abundant use of the enlightened theme. So to get started, we need to create an environment that we can log in. And we've been doing that using EC2, Amazon's Elastic Compute Cloud. So we're creating virtual machines in the cloud that are highly configurable, and you pay for what you use. So this makes it great for testing. They're also elastic, which means they're scalable. If you have a system that's dual core, eight gigabytes of memory, well, now it could be an eight core with 64 gigabytes of memory. Amazon also has automatic scaling. If something is underperforming because it's using too much of the system's resources, Amazon will scale that up or back down as is needed. I bring that up because we're not using it in performance testing. We want to know how it's going to perform with our current configuration. And when it comes to testing for load testing, we're actually scaling out. Instead of building up a system, we're adding systems to our configuration to perform those tests. So to do that, we need to configure an EC2 instance with FileMaker Server, and we also need to configure an EC2 instance with FileMaker Pro Advanced that will serve as our clients. And when we're configuring those, we're doing it to mirror our production environment. So we want to make sure that it's the same as what our client plans to use, whether it's a physical in-house server, if it's in a data center, or even if they're using AWS and FileMaker Cloud. And when we're looking at this configuration, we're looking at things like the CPU, the processing power, both its clock speed, how fast it runs, and how many logical cores. With memory, we're looking at capacity. Does it have eight gigabytes of RAM, 64, 128? And then storage, we're looking at type and speed. Is it a solid state drive, a hard drive? Are they in a RAID configuration? And finally, with network, we have tools available like a bandwidth limiter so we can match the speeds of our client's configuration. And there's also third-party tools that you can use to introduce latency if you need to test that. I also want to point out that with the network, we need to configure a static IP. We want all of our clients that are testing the database to be able to reach it at the same point. And the way we do that is with EC2 instance types. The two that I use the most in performance testing are general purpose and compute optimized. So general purpose has a good balance between processing power, memory, and network resources for applications that require moderate usage. And compute optimized has high performance processors that are better for compute intensive workloads. Some of the other instance types are memory optimized, which has more memory per processor and overall allows a higher memory capacity. And there's even instances that allow you to run in-memory databases. Accelerated computing combi combines a high-performance processor with a graphics card. This allows tasks such as machine learning to be performed. And then storage optimized, we can choose low latency solid state drives that allow a high throughput and high random input output or read write. Or if you need high capacity, you can get ones with physical hard drives attached to the virtual machine to allow high throughput. I want to point out that we also need to make sure we're choosing the right instance for the clients that we're testing with. If your client has only old machines that meet the minimum specifications of FileMaker, 
then we need to do that same configuration as well. If they do a mix and match, everybody has their own computer, some Macs, some Windows, usually I'll test using the recommended specifications for running FileMaker Pro Advanced. Some of the advanced configuration that we do is IM roles. So that's allowing permissions to access your EC2 instances. If you have a client that needs to stay up to date with billing, you can give them access to billing, they can get into the dashboard, but they can't start and stop the instances that you're using for your tests. Security groups control your network configuration. Will they be on the internet? Will it be LAN only? And then Elastic IP is the service that we use for static IPs. Each time an EC2 instance is spun up, it has its own IP address. The Elastic IP is linked to the instance, and that is the IP address that we point to. And then volumes, we're looking at the size, how many drives there are, if for some reason did they decide that all of their container data is stored on another hard drive, and also are they in that RAID configuration. All of this comes at a cost. EC2 varies widely in the prices, and they range from about a penny per hour to $33 an hour. So I wanna show you what it can look like with a testing configuration that I've used in the past for your actual cost. So 40 hours a week for four weeks, 160 hours. To run a 2XL server would cost about $69. To run a client on a medium instance will cost about $10. When it comes to Elastic IP, we only pay for the time that it's not used. So those 160 hours, it's linked to our server, we're not paying for it. Otherwise, we pay about a half a cent each hour that it's not used. So over four weeks, 512 hours, it costs us $2.46. Volumes, in this example, the volume that I use costs 12 and a half cents per gigabyte per month so 100 gigabyte volume is gonna cost $12.50. And then this is just a side note. If you're running Windows with SQL pre-installed and pre-licensed, the cost is much higher. And your server cost will be about two and a half to five times the cost, depending on if you're using SQL standard, web, or enterprise. This isn't something that I've had to do, but I just wanted to point out that it is an additional cost. So all of this adds up to about $95 for the month, 40 hours a week for four weeks. And if you're really fast with numbers, you may be wondering, hey, Justin, where'd the extra 10 cents come from? It's just because the total was calculated with more precision to match Amazon's billing. And like I said, you know, hardware varies, and so do the costs. So I wanna show you what it would be like if I change this to be another configuration that I use. This one uses a compute intensive system, a C5, and it's a 4XL. So now the server cost is increased to $226, and overall, it's gonna cost us about $252. That number jumped up fast. It's more than twice as much as the other configuration. But consider what the cost would be to have just 10 people sit down and do QA on a database at the same time for an hour suddenly that becomes a small number again. So once we have our instances configured, we can start setting up automation and logging. One of the tools that we use is Amazon CloudWatch. And if you were at the Zabbix presentation, this is Amazon's version of Zabbix. Honestly, had I been giving this presentation last year, this slide would say Zabbix but it allows you to monitor applications and also understand how system-wide changes affect performance and optimize your resource utilization. You can also provide a unified view in a dashboard of the operational health of your systems. And when we're configuring the server, we need to configure CloudWatch for that hardware monitoring or Zabbix or whatever you use to monitor the hardware. 
we also need to script the workflow that we're going to test. And if I'm going through a workflow where I'm reconciling invoices, I can't just say, hey, how long does it take for the reconcile invoices script to run? I need to look at the entire process from the user's standpoint. If they come in, they're gonna click a button and go to a layout with invoices, and then they're gonna go through a list, choose the invoice, and go into it to reconcile it. That all needs to be accounted for. So the first step in there is going to be using the actual script that's called when they click that button to navigate to the layout. Then we're going to insert a pause for the average time it takes a user to find the invoice that they want to reconcile. We're gonna do the other navigation script and then we're gonna do all of the scripting for reconcile invoices. The reason for this is we may run into issues that aren't just within scripts themselves. Now we need to insert logging script steps. And I usually do this very general at first. So that's maybe all of the user navigations put together. Maybe something like a large find. And then the reconcile invoices step. We also need to disable custom dialogues because a user is not going to be at the computer to click OK or cancel. And if there's a value in there, we need to preset those values. And as a side note, something else I like to throw in there is a test confirmation at the start of my test. Maybe a window that pops up 15 seconds where I can cancel the test, otherwise it continues with it, or I'll configure it to my user. That way, whenever I spin up the database, it doesn't try to run the test right out of the gate. And some of the details that we're grabbing in these tests, first and foremost, is duration. We wanna know how long it takes to do something. And we're gathering that as a step basis and total duration for the entire process. We're also gathering information about the script that initiated the log. And of course, that needs to be passed as a parameter. Otherwise, you'll start out like I did and have 20 logs that say they were all called by write to log. We're also gathering information about records. How many records are open and what is their state? The layout that we're on and found count. Found count is also great for validating your data. When you're increasing data volume, often you use steps like duplicate record or import records. And if we're running a test, we don't want 500 line items linked to the record that we're using in the test if it normally only has five. And gathering information about found count will help you find that quickly if there's something that you've missed. I also want to talk about the observer effect. So the outcome of an experiment is inevitably altered by the act of observing it. I think a great example of this is if you think about an electron in superposition. No, I'm kidding. I'm not gonna stand up here and explain quantum mechanics. If you think about measuring the pressure in a tire, every time you put the gauge on the stem, you're letting some air out of the tire so you know how much pressure is in it. You changed the pressure in the tire albeit in this circumstance very little, it's something you need to account for. So every time we insert a logging script step, it takes time. We're gathering information like the script, the layout that it's in, information about the records, and then we're putting this information into a database. And I've minimized this by making the very first step that I do in a log, calculating the duration from the last log. I then gather all of the information that I need, pass it into the database that's storing the logs, and at the end of all of that, I then grab a new time as the start for the next. This has worked very well, and whether I start off with just one log at the beginning and one at the end, or if I've put 25 logs in between, I consistently come up with the same duration. If you're wondering about Fluffy up here, that is Schrodinger's cat. He was both dead and alive before this slide, and I'm happy it turned out this way. When it comes to configuration, configuring the client, most of it's done in the operating system. 
So what we need to do is create a user that's automatically going to log on when the system starts up. And I do want to point out, this is not good security practice. These instances and images should never be used for production. And then I like to add the user to the remote desktop users group. It's not something that you have to do. And the reason I like it is if I run a load test with 25 clients connecting, all is said and done, and I only have 24 results, I want to pop into the one that I didn't get a result from and see what happened. After that, you create a URL shortcut to the FileMaker application, and then you create a script. It could be batch, PowerShell, it doesn't matter. You just set it up in a group policy object for the user. When that user logs on, it automatically runs the shortcut that we made to the FileMaker app. Now that we've set up the client, we need to create an image of it. And the reason that we do that is that image is what lets us launch multiple clients to test them. They'll all have the same configuration. So they come with the URL in there, the batch scripting, the users, and it is good to go. However, Remember towards the beginning of the slide, Einstein's, Einstein said there are two things that are infinite, and the resources of Amazon and AWS was not one of them. So we do have some limitations. Software, well, we can spin up instances that have Windows Server, and we can spin up Linux, Linux instances, but we can't do something that runs OS X. Also, there are not images available for consumer versions of Windows. So all of the testing is done using Windows Server. With the hardware, it's not going to be exact. Clients have unique configurations all the time. They split up their physical resources between virtual machines in their physical servers. So you might have something that has 17 logical cores, but the closest you're going to get with AWS is 16. It's close enough to give us a good picture of how it's going to perform. And then the number of instances. Amazon has a limit on the number of instances that you can start up at once. This limit can be raised if you have a legitimate purpose, like performance testing, and it's a simple ticket to Amazon. However, you cannot do it for network performance testing. The reason for that is you get a bunch of people testing maximum input and output, and suddenly AWS slows to a crawl. Another solution that we looked at was screen automation testing. And it's something that we steered away from for a few reasons. But screen automation testing is where it simulates all of the user's actions. A dialog comes up, it clicks on the dialog for you. Well, the configuration cost is higher because we need to have FileMaker server running and we need to have a client running in order to be setting up the screen automation. Also, screen automation has great logs, but typically they're designed to be consumed inside of the tool. Also, anytime we made a change, added a dialog, took one out, removed a layout, we needed to update the screen automation configuration, but then we also needed to create a new image. With the testing steps being in FileMaker Server, we don't have to create a new image each time. The integration with FileMaker was questionable. A lot of the tools know when a window pops up, and it might be based on .NET. But with FileMaker, a lot of it's done with XML. So was the tool going to know that the dialog had popped up? We didn't know. And then, of course, being on a familiar platform and setting it up there, we got the extra information about records, layouts, scripts. So you get everything configured, now you have the chance to start getting in some numbers. We want to work with that data. So when we're interpreting them, we're looking at things like time-intensive processes. Is there a script that takes five minutes? Is there a loop that takes two? Errors. Record lock is a great example of this. We tested a solution that appeared to be working great, but during the first load test, we found out there was a layout with a script trigger on it. 
When two users tried to land on that layout at the same time, the same default record was loaded, and we began getting record lock errors. Resource utilization, are we consuming 100% of the processor, 100% of the memory? And also software limitations. If you try to test 10 clients and you have a five user license, you're gonna quickly find out it doesn't work. So these are some of the insights that we've been able to gather with our load tests and performance tests. I talked a little bit about CloudWatch, and it's been a great tool for identifying bottlenecks and also informing hardware decisions. So you can see, you know, we don't use much processor, but we're consuming all of the memory in a system. We now know that's the problem. We need to look at something to increase the amount of memory that we have. But we can also use this to inform hardware decisions. In one case, I had a client that was concerned about performance in one of their FileMaker applications and considering upgrading their database, or sorry, their server. These numbers are somewhat representative of what we found. When they were running their solution, the server wasn't really being taxed. And yes, while I built another system that was codenamed Beefier and ran it, we got better numbers, but does it really justify what is sometimes six figures for bringing in new hardware? So we're able to make that determination without having gotten the hardware in the first place. And CloudWatch can also be used for logging. To set it up for logging, we need to go through some steps. We have a FileMaker script that exports the logs, and then we configure CloudWatch with our configuration file on AWS to consume that log file. When we do that, we also need a FileMaker script to import the CloudWatch status file. The reason for that, CloudWatch grabs so much of a log at a time, and it'll never grab more than that. With FileMaker 18, this isn't so much a concern because now we can append to files, but we didn't want to overwrite and lose some of our logs. We were then viewing logs in the CloudWatch web interface, and really for data analysis, we were exporting them to other tools. So while you can do logging directly within CloudWatch, we are FileMaker developers. And that's what I've switched to. I do my logging in FileMaker now, so I can collect logs and display additional information that gives me and my team a better insight into what we're seeing. And like I said, with the extra steps that we have, seeing everything, you know, this script called this log so many times, it's helpful. Of course, we can develop custom views. So what I present to my team as a finding isn't necessarily what I'm going to present to a client. I'm gonna give them something that's been cleaned up and is easier for them to consume. And comparisons has been a great tool as well. With that, I may make changes as I go along. Has navigation been a bit slow? Maybe I'll try a layout that doesn't have objects on it. I might also take a blanket approach. Do I think there's a problem in auto enters? I'm just gonna go ahead and stop all in auto enters for this table and see what it looks like. And looking at the numbers side by side, I can help get it narrowed down. In FileMaker, I've also begun using the Amazon EC2 API. This allows me to run my tests without ever leaving the FileMaker logging solution. And to get started with this, you really only need three calls. Describe instance status, which tells you, is my instance running? Is it stopped? And then reboot and start instances, which I hope we all understand what those are. And you might be wondering, you know, why would I bother to take the time to write in all of the logic to start an instance when it stopped and reboot it if it's running? I could just tell it to stop all of my clients and start them up again. When they stop, if they're already stopped, I'll get an error, I don't care about it. And the reason for that is Amazon Windows instances are billed by the hour. 
So if I want to run five tests that are 10 minutes long each, if I reboot in between each of those, it's going to bill me for an hour. If I start and stop each one, I'm now going to be billed for five hours. And let me show you what some of the numbers look like that we've been finding. This is where it starts to get interesting. So this is an example of a data volume test. So we're looking at one month of data volume, three months of data volume, and 12 months of data volume. How many records are in each table of what the client expects from their daily work? We can see the login step. It's constant across the board. That's great. User navigation, we had a bit of an uptick. It didn't go up again at 12 months. It doesn't seem to be a concern. But reconcile invoices, we're seeing a linear increase. From one month to three months, it increased threefold. From three months to 12 months, it increased fourfold. And these are representative of real world numbers that we have run into. So now what I'll start to do is break it down. OK, I know there's a problem in my reconcile invoices step. And when I break them down, I like to pick a data set that's going to be representative of the issue, so three months. That way, I can clearly see what it is. And I could possibly see other issues. Here, end of day script, 33 seconds, might be a concern. I want to take a look at it. But I'm not running it with 12 months of data volume because I don't want to spend 28 minutes every time I run the test to see if I've been able to make a change or if I'm getting a higher resolution of logs, where's the problem at this time? So in here, there's a script, validate invoice, takes almost six minutes to run, and then I'll break that down into sections. Take a look at some things that could possibly be an issue if there's a find that I know has a particularly large found set, loops, or entire sections that are typically well commented in code are a good way to look at breakdown of a script. At this point, it might become apparent. I see what I did wrong in that loop. Let's get that taken care of. You run another test, you're good to go. Otherwise, you might continue to increase the resolution of your logging sometimes all the way down to the individual script step until you find out what's going on. And some of those findings that we've been coming across are things like execute SQL. So when you work with a table and execute SQL, if there's an open record, it's going to pull down that entire table. Layout objects. This can be an issue during navigation. Is there a layout that just has a sheer number of, or a sheer high volume of objects on it? Are there a lot of them with conditional formatting? Replace field contents can be an issue in series. If you have a bunch of them in a row, it's going to pull down a record, it's going to replace that value, and then it's going to pull down the next record and replace that value, so on and so forth. And then you're going to do it again for the next value. Maybe it's better to use a loop with set field inside. Pull down one record, replace all of its values, and then move on to the next. Like I mentioned, record lock. It is crazy some of the places that you will find record lock in. And then another area is auto enter and calculations. Sometimes you have tables that just have a very high number of calculations going on. And if you're continuously making changes, they're going on over and over again, especially if they have execute SQL in them. Combine those two, and you can really slow down a database. Now, most of you have probably forgotten, towards the beginning of this presentation, I posed a bit of a trivia question, and that was, what's wrong here? As a quick recap, it's a layout. It just has a merge variable on it. We're setting a static text string to that merge variable, opening up the window as a card window, displaying it for a few seconds, and then we're closing the window. Anyone know what's wrong here? Hmm? I didn't do it, but that's a good point. Um, 
uh, he wanted to know why a global variable was being used here. And like I said, it wasn't my solution, but I'm guessing just an easy way to display a merge variable for this window. With that being said, I apologize for doing this because I hate them. It's a bit of a trick question. It's step four, close window. And I know you're wondering, how could close window be the issue? Well, when this was happening, there's this great window, it would pop up, it would show a message for a few seconds, it would go away. When we increased data volume, the closed window step started to take 30 seconds. And then after that, increasing it again, it was taking five minutes. And to be honest, this is one that I'm still digging into and I don't fully understand. We've looked at some of the obvious culprits like script triggers, and we've also experimented a little bit. You know, what if the layout's in the same context that we're in now? Something else that's quite unusual is we found out that if you commit immediately before step one, the problem goes away. So I'll continue to dig into this, but my point is, with performance testing, I found something that's a bit unexpected, and never before would I have thought to commit a record before performing this script for that window. And I was told time and time again there would be lots and lots of questions. So I tried to leave a good chunk for it, and I threw an extra five minutes on. Any questions? And time and time again, I was told wrong. Okay, so the question is, how do I generate the data in the first way to do the data volume tests? Normally, I start with a subset of the data that they already have from testing, but they haven't been testing it for a year, so it's not available there. And depending on the data, I'll look at something like taking that subset and maybe taking a thousand records from it and bringing them in repeatedly over an import or by duplicating the records. And that's why I mentioned that it's important to sanitize your data because you may have something linked to something else that shouldn't be. But really, you only need a few of those records to be sanitized to properly perform your tests. Yes? Chuck. Um, the the automation aspect and floating this out onto Amazon is uh, something that we've been playing with also. A slight adjustment that we've done to this type of model is uh, in, the, in the database file itself, uh, we often have what many people use, a one record uh, file for, or, or table for setting system-wide things and so forth. And a lot of times what we'll do is when we spin up these instances, the automation is going to launch the application and then immediately throw it into a loop, looking every five seconds perhaps on all the clients for a checkbox to go into that one record file on the server. And that allows us to kind of toggle that on and activate the serving of these uh, you know, 25 workstations in the cloud, but also to sit there and say, let's, let's check that box off, everything goes back dormant for a second, we can adjust the RAM, we can play around with some other server logging uh, or s configuration settings, and then hit the checkbox again and resume testing in that respect. So you can kind of turn off and turn on the testing across multiple clients all at once without having to run around to 20 desktops or restart the entire thing from scratch. Okay. Uh that's good information, and uh, I do use a bit of a one record myself uh, with configuration for the logs that have some parent information like a test description, and then the logs go into that particular test, and it's also what holds or gives it information about the total duration that's going to be stored and information like that. Um, but no, I hadn't thought about running it in a loop like that, so that's an interesting approach. Uh, like I said, uh, I've been doing it with the API and actually rebooting the instances. Any other questions?
This thing likes to go backwards sometimes. All right. Oh, go ahead. Have you, have you ever tried, um, instead of commit, go to field? If Have that been a diff, uh, different speed? Because I see sometimes when um, that go to field, it lets go the record, and then you can do that card. Does that work better than the commit? It's not a step that I've tried. Uh, and we actually have, you know, a few other ideas. You know, what about if we base that window off of a table that basically has no fields in it, things like that. But ultimately, we want to get down to what's the root cause? Why is this happening when we close the window? Right now, we do have the workaround commit, and possibly go to field would work just as well. But that doesn't help us. We need to know why it was happening. I just wanted to know if you knew any difference from either commit or go to field will be will work better. That I don't. Uh, maybe something I throw at it when I get back. Uh, All right. Thank you. All right. Well, I want to once again thank. Oh, we've got another question. Just one one per slide, I guess. Actually, not so much a question, just another observation and some performance enhancements that can come up, uh, especially when you're in loops creating a lot of records or need a lot of uh, records created, that it's actually easier, quicker, much more performant to just create an array of all your uh, data, export that, import it in, especially if you have auto-enter options, turn those off on the import, create all those into your array. It's just a direct import, and it's exponentially faster. Yep, that is true. And uh, we've worked in a couple solutions that are set up that way while testing them. All right. Well, thank you for coming out. Please remember, session evaluations online. Thank you.